It's Derek G Six Volumes. It's the mailbag. It's funny because I got a few questions about what a mailbag is on in my DMs, which I thought people knew what it was. But you know, I do have audiences from around the world, so maybe they don't know what it is. I should have called it AMA, ask me anything, questions and answers, but perhaps it's inspired by Bill Simmons and the term mailbag and assumed that it was the norm, but perhaps it's not. The Mailbag, Stereo G Speaks Volume is my podcast where I think about thinking about things and about music and things with culture and everything in between. I did an episode about Fred again last week, and this week I thought every so often, once every few months, I will answer your questions because it... I should, I, I will always have generally a thesis, a, a direction, something I want to talk about and address, but it's also nice to kind of connect in a different way, expand upon, you know, you getting to know me and my thoughts about music, so, and other things. So I put a question out on Instagram, mailbag questions, ask me anything, and I have a whole bunch. So looking forward to talking through that. And then also, a little appendix at the end. Addressing a little part of the Fred again conversation that we had last week. But we'll save that for the end. Thank you very much for sending your questions through. Thank you very much for rating the podcast. I like to see those numbers because it means you're listening. And, uh, you know, if you like it, share it. I don't know. I, I don't really do that sort of stuff. So I'm going to stop there. So... I have my phone in front of me and we are just going to go through questions. They're, these are fun. The questions I haven't thought too much about, but clearly I've identified the ones that I like. They are all about some music, some hi-fi, some general questions about my life. And we can dig in with the first one, which comes from Marin Shales, I want to say. What and I put this one because I love this one first because I think it's such an interesting question. What would Olivia Rodrigo do to ensure she's not a one-hit wonder? Why did you know to ask me this question? Because as soon as I saw that, I'm like, ooh, there's a lot to chew on in that question. So Olivia Rodrigo, if you don't know, breakout star in 2020 with her song Driver's License and then the song Good For You. Um, the song that had an introduction that sounded like Pump It Up from Elvis Costello. Um, there were people talking about, you know, interpolation and, you know, plagiarism and all that. But I don't think that that was a huge point. Breakout star for being a um, the voice of a heartbroken youth or perhaps even the voice of a um, young, you know, 12-year-old girl that is like coming into their own and and wanting to express this idea of what love and relationships is about and uh, released this album called Sour and suddenly was the biggest artist, you know, outside of, outside of Billie Eilish in the pop world. And um, that question, what would Olivia Rodrigo do to ensure she's not a one-hit wonder is, um, is an interesting one because I liked Driver's License a lot. I thought that was such a fantastic pop song. Because what it did is, what one thing I really like about a really solid, unique pop song is specificity. If you don't know the song, it's about really getting, being excited about getting a driver's license because then finally you are able to drive to your partner, your boyfriend's house, and it turns out that she got her driver's license, but they're now broken up, and now all she thinks about. You know, she, all she does is drive past, not all she does, but she drives past this house, you know, thinking about what could have been. Damn. You know, when you hear, when you hear the story in the song, you're like, you almost get transported to the place in which this, this young woman, this character is, is feeling and expressing. It's like, damn, I've never been in that scenario, but I can almost relate to it. It's, it's, it was a brilliant song. I think that, the sophomore album, as they call it, the second album, there's a lot of pressure because she obviously had good songs behind her for the first one. She was known, was she in, you know, in, in a Disney show? I think so, something like that. So she had the, the pedigree. 
And then it's good songwriting, good marketing, major label push, and suddenly she's a big thing. And how do you go from there? And after Billy's first main release, I forget the name of it, um, and then there was Happier Than Ever, which was still a big record, but I think people are like, oh. oh, okay. This is less exciting. If you think about music history, and I think about it for myself, second albums are really hard. And I think that you can either stay the course, which is kind of what Billy did. And so it's kind of a, a bit of like, oh, you know, I'm kind of used to this sound and she has this kind of like 1950s aesthetic, but the sound is kind of similar. And I think that's why people were a bit dis disappointed, quote unquote, it still did extremely well. So she didn't fail. I think Olivia Rodrigo can either stay the course and be that kind of jilted young woman that feels like there's like angst, pop angst. It was Paramore, wasn't it? That people were saying she she interpolated or whatever, um, which is a nice place to be in. And I'm just trying to think, I'm not an A&R, an but if, if I was to think about what would be best, I think there's still legs in that kind of, you know, Taylor Swift has built her whole career on being, you know, jilted or in love or like in various stages of love. So I don't think it would be too much to, to keep wearing that a bit more because, you know, once that's done, you're done. That's one way of going. I think another way of going is like she either, which many artists do, you go like either, you know, in this narrative that she's building, either really in love and it's really romantic and it's really sunny or she's like someone out for revenge not just jilted and like good for you or driver's license it's like you know payback you don't know me now we had a cute thing going and now i'm like sexy and you know and i'm, I'm not trying to generalize or gender but i think it, because her world was built around like young love and all the the pleasure and pain that goes with that then there is a narrative build of like, well, I had a sweet time and now I'm out to really find myself some more. Um, I think, so there's there's the arc of staying the course, there's the arc of maturing as a woman and expressing different types of love. I think that there is a third option, which is being it like more of an artist. I doubt that's going to happen though, especially comes from Disney. I think she will be more in the pop sphere. And I think that uh, she won't go down the realm of like collaborating with Japanese breakfast. That would be cool. And, and you know, another a half Asian um, artist and, and doing more like beautiful songs that might put her in a lane of, you know, take me more seriously in a music space type thing. I don't think Olivia Rodrigo is that. I think she represents more of the overarching pop star. And I think, so to answer your question, what would she do in short? She's not a one hit wonder. I would be patient. I would, you know, narrow down about what you want to express in the world, but I would, I would find that as intense of a song as driver's license, maybe in a new way that really you feel like you're communicating something unique. Uh, and I think, I don't think that she's the most compelling character from a, a personality point of view. I don't think she's very compelling in terms of a visual point of view, but I think she, I think I, I can understand it more because my friend who has like an 11 or 12 year old at, at the time was like, she is obsessed with little Rodrigo and she's like screaming from the top of her lungs, good for you. Like she kind of is embodying the idea of what, what the idea of what it would be like to break up with a boy that you had a crush on. And I'm like, yeah, okay. I get it. I get, I get the kind of energy that she's portraying to, to a younger audience. So, wow. I didn't think I'd talk about that much. Jeez. I have so many questions to go through. I will not take that long next time. Having a huge collection, how do you discover music that, that's within your own collection? Asked Daniel Grossman. Grossman? I love that question because it's it's very nuanced to me because I do have a huge collection of music, whether it's on my computer or in physical form. And I think one of the blessings of doing radio is that you can 
you really have to consume and absorb and be aware of so many music releases. And so I have a depth and breadth of knowledge about music because I've had to stay so close and attached to what's coming out. Conversely, the problem with that is that you have to always be moving forward. And so I never had a huge amount of time to look back. So I was listening for fun based off this question, one of my older radio shows the other day, and I only was really familiar with about 60% of it. And some other ones, I was like, it was almost like I was discovering it for the first time. And I was like, hmm, what's that? I like this song. And, and so you kind of get caught in this place of like forward momentum, meaning I, I have a shallower relationship with the songs, but a deeper relationship with music as a whole. So I don't just like, when people were like, you know, what's your opinion of Moto Mami? I didn't listen to it more than two times and all like Renaissance was the same. It's like, is it your favorite album of all time? And it's like, I kind of just move quickly. And I, that's not a good thing. And I wish I had more time with all of these albums. But so I think that the, the best way that I can discover music in my own collection is probably listen to past radio shows because I've curated it for myself and for others. And it's all there for the taking. Otherwise, sometimes when I have like absolutely nothing to do, I put the songs that I put in radio shows in folders. So a folk folder, a dream pop folder, and then I might just put on my dream pop playlist and then almost discover the music by categorizing and organizing in there. Next question is from Kieran Ballon of all the artistic mediums. Where would you say music ranks in terms of self-expression? That is such a deep question. And uh I had to like look up just to refresh myself what would be defined as artistic mediums. But if I was to like not look at this list that I just pulled out, I would think uh, dance, visual art, uh, theater, music. Uh, now I'm blanking. They, they've got, oh, they've got in here painting, sculpture, literature, architecture, cinema, of course, cinema, music, and and, and theater. So that's not the definitive list because I don't have dance in there. And I think dance is a huge one. The question is, where would you say music ra ranks in terms of self-expression? I think quite high, but not, I think honestly, define, define art because like if I'm humming to myself, is that an art form? No. You know, um, is, is it an artistic medium? No. Self-expression? Yeah. I think that uh, perhaps what I think about in terms of ranking, in terms of self-expression, I would say that uh, how many layers of people get in the way of those things and how pure can you express these things to an audience? Uh, so I think film is one of the you know high watermarks of ex artistic expression because you combine pretty much all of these things into one theater, movement, music, you know, writing, you know, a visual art medium as well. And perhaps that it ranks highly in terms of like uh, – an art form, but then it's in terms of self-expression, it's not, it's like very rare that a film expresses the self because there's like a thousand people that work on it and every other person has a, a hand in it. I would say that from a purity form, visual art, dance and music are the closest to self-expression. I would say like when I question what is art, I do think about um, dance being the best express self-expression because you see babies you see us most people can't sing but most people like to move to music and i think that is a, a very important self and underrated self-expression but then it's not necessarily art if i'm if i'm dancing in a room on my own so there is there needs to be an audience in order for it to be art and there needs to be a, a position put forward so i would say to not meander too much because it's a very difficult question, I would say music is probably um, alongside, you know, visual art, painting, or like, you know, 
any sort of sculpting or, or creation uh, and photography. It would be similar because the the ability to capture an idea and express it to an audience without the fewest amount of layers in between, ex, you know, creation and expression to an audience is there's there's a lot fewer barriers. You know, I can sing into a microphone with a guitar, and I as many people have done and they you know for 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 all of time and you can connect with people on a very deep level you know a, a painting can take a little bit longer in some ways and it's a very consumable medium too so did i rank them <laughs> probably not it, next question if you had an if you had to open a cocktail bar slash record shop that featured or played one genre what would you do says the tan hands I think that's fairly obvious to me that ah, I hate being generic because like Japanese people in their jazz bars, but it, I think it would be jazz. I think if I was to really have an extensive collection of any vinyl, it would be jazz because I think that it's so complicated, so deep, but so meaningful. And I think that there's so many ways to express jazz that i like whether it's spiritual whether it's bebop whether it's free whether it's uh like more of the smoother stuff whether it's blue note i think that you could probably put on jazz for any moment if you were to have a cocktail bar which is to say the calm stuff the crazy stuff the really uplifting things i think if i was to choose a genre as much as i like folk as much as i like hip hop, I would not want to be listening to that all day long. I think that would be really difficult. So in saying that, like, I think it'd be cool if someone opened a record bar that was all indie music and folk music. Imagine you play everything from John Martin to Arcade Fire. Interesting. Interesting. I wouldn't do it myself, but someone should do it. Next one. You had mentioned diving into your thoughts on musical taste. Give us a teaser, says Fay 13 Yeah, I don't know if I'm, I'm ever going to make a video on, on it because I don't think I have resolved thoughts. But basically, I find it really interesting, the idea of taste and people saying to me, you have really good taste. And it's like, what does that mean? Like, it's, it's nice to hear, but what does that mean? And do I? And does my neighbor think I have good taste? You know, does my sister think I have good taste that likes K-pop? Like, it's like... I think my wife said it best. I think that taste is a rough, <laughs> basically when you think someone has good taste when it's a reflection of you and your taste. <laughs> but I think it's a, I think perhaps what taste is, is like someone who has a breadth of understanding um, of a art form and is able to appreciate, curate and present a world which can combine all of these, I guess, details to which that you can have big mainstream things and you can have really quiet underground things and they all sit together and in, in, in a, a package that is digestible and quite beautiful, perhaps. Because I don't think that you look at someone that like really loves new metal and you go, ooh, and wears like new metal t-shirts and stuff. You don't, no offense to them, but no one's looking at them going, you have good taste. And I guess because it's a specific, it's our taste, it's a specific taste. Whereas perhaps someone like myself, it's more of a, uh, a broad taste. And so, yeah, that, that, that's what I've been like. If, if you have, if, if you guys have any answers on these questions, please put them in the comments because I don't have, this is not, it's not definitive. And I'm still chewing on the idea of what taste means. And maybe I'll do a podcast about it one day, but I don't have solid thoughts. What are your thoughts on hi-fi streaming serv services, brackets, Tidal, or is Spotify good enough? Great question. I forgot to say who mentioned that. I think Spotify is good enough. I, I think streaming services... Uh, offer very sim similar catalogs. I think that the point of differentiation is the experience, the UI, and then some offer higher quality bitrate. Now, I have nice speakers and I have AB tested them on my speakers and I really don't think 
there's a discernible difference. I've tried like my speakers with, you know, plugging into the headphone jack versus USB cable and USB cable, like there's less because it's a digital direct into the, the amp or speaker should produce a more pure sound. And I can't, I'm like, well, does the bass go a bit deeper maybe? Am I noticing that? I, it's so hard to tell. And I think that the only way you can really, really discernibly tell these things is if you have a really high quality digital to analog converter, you have a really high quality amp, you have really high quality speakers. I only have parts of those because of, of affordability. And so if I'm switching between Tidal and Spotify, there isn't a difference to the point where I'm like, oh, yeah. And I remember when uh, Amazon Music first launched and their whole thing before everyone else, how they had like the highest quality. And I listened to it and I was like, I'm pretty sure I can tell the difference. But this app sucks. And the, the experience and the playlists and the accessibility to all these different things and maybe I have to share my playlist with my friends is impossible. So that I think I can tell the difference is not worth as much as I'd rather share my playlist with my friend who I know has the same streaming platform as me. So don't sweat the small stuff. Spotify is good enough. And this is not a promotion for them. All of them are good enough and don't sweat the small stuff. It's about what you use and, and what you like and the marginal differences in audio quality. Not a big deal. Do you have a metric to determine if a song is good or not or the feeling it gives? From Christian, I believe the name is. I think I'm going to answer this. The, I'll put the second question to, at, at the same time because I think they're uh, interrelated. And then the next person asks, what's your favorite sonic textures that scratch your brain? Favorite parts of songs that get you, says Grace Snow.Wave. I do not have a metric. I don't think that it is possible to have a metric about if a song is good or not. I do have sonic te textures that scratch my brain. So I don't go looking for them at all. I think I like melodies a lot. Take Crowded House. I think Crowded House is one of the greatest, you know, Neil Finn is one of the greatest melody writers of all time. I look for those. If there's a really soaring, beautiful melody chorus, I'm I'm absolutely there. I do like a nice falsetto. I like a very fragile, painful, pained voice. I like a nice bass line. I like a beautifully uh, reserved guitar solo. Uh, yeah. I don't like drama too much. I like subtlety. I like fragility. Um, Jessica Pratt is probably a good example of that in terms of fragility, voice, and melody. Uh, I can't remember the name of the song. Maybe I'll put it in the show notes. But there, I think those sort of things scratch my itch. And so there's no metric for whether a song's good or not. I think that to your question, though, as a radio person, as a DJ, I can tell what a good song is in my opinion, relatively quickly, based on factors of, you know, does it develop, does it grow? Is it is it beautiful? Does it, I think if it's too monotonous, you can tell fairly quickly. Like when I had to absorb a lot of music and judge all the releases coming out, I'd listen to it and you could hear the intro and then you could scrub to some of the verse, some of the chorus, and, and and then kind of get a sense if it was worth listening to in full. And I think that the best music, you can tell that the musician is interested, interested in creating something beautiful. And I think that's fairly obvious. And when you hear it, it's just lazy and generic. It, I think it's fairly obvious. So that's what I look for, but it's not a metric. It's not like I go in there going like, all right, I'm going to listen to from zero to zero, zero seven and then i'm going to listen 35 seconds in and then i'm going to listen to the bridge and if those all sound good it's a sense thing it's a taste thing what have we got next recommendations for walking around in london says krista abraham i'm guessing you mean music 
when drill was big, and it still is, and I think the UK drill, rap, grime scene, drum and bass, jungle, that sort of stuff I think is great for walking around London. It depends where you're walking. If you're walking in bloody uh, Mayfair, <laughs> you're probably not going to relate to it. You should probably, probably be listening to something a lot more affluent. But I think when I lived there, I got that music a lot more drum and bass, jungle, drill, because from my uh, very sheltered experience of living in Sydney, which is sunny and warm and safe, you, I don't, I couldn't understand or relate to that music as much. But when you're in the like, the cold of London, which is a long cold, you know, nine months of the year, there's a lot of concrete around and lots of places you might be walking. You don't feel entirely safe. Some places, not all places, but some places. And you're listening to that stuff. It's like, I get it. Because you're hunched over with your hands in your pockets with something covering your your neck and sometimes your face because it's so cold and you're like, this stuff is sounds like a grind. And you know, I feel like that that really like helped me embody the idea of what those genres were about. What was the first artist you considered your favorite or you're super into by by nev.exe? So there was this group called Regurgitator. <laughs> which is an Australian pop, uh, punk, grunge, evolved into, you know, uh, eight, almost 8-bit eight electronica in the 90s. Now, I first heavily got into them because my uncle was into them, and he was the cool uncle, right? And he introduced me to them. And then I got into it because the lead singer, Quine Newmans, was uh, Asian-Australian. Newmans is, what is that? Is he... Quan is that Vietnamese? I, I can't. I'm not quite sure. And um, he wore glasses, and he they kind of like em, embraced the nerdiness. And for someone, a, a young Asian boy with short hair and glasses, that I, I think a lot about, and we'll talk about one day the idea of representation, and and it just is true. You saw someone, you're like, I didn't even know that that was allowed. I didn't even know people would accept someone like him or like me doing things like that. Uh, and and I admired him and aspired to be him because of that. So it was more than the music. And I listen back to the music now, and it's definitely aged. Uh, their first album, Two Playing, is actually quite ballsy and hairy and, and, and quite impressive, to be honest. Their next album, Unit, it was like they delved into like electronica, like early electronica, and didn't always pay off, but I think there's some good pop songs in there. And then they kind of got more, more and more pop, and I don't think that they're like a globally significant band, but they were significant to me. And I had every one of their albums. I was obsessed with every one of their albums. I listened to it in my discman. I listened to it all the time, and and served the purpose of me being a very, very passionate lover of of music and the evolution of music and how I identify with it. So I think Quan and I think Regurgitator for that, but I definitely don't listen to it anymore. I put this one in here because I don't. I thought maybe it would be interesting to see how I, I kind of work this out. Is the ha is the hamburger considered a sandwich by definition? By <laughs> Ryan Y Y Z F. Is the hamburger considered a sandwich by definition? I like asking that question around a hot dog as well. Uh, I would say it is not because a bun is different to a piece of bread. I think a sandwich constitutes uh, being bookended by, sandwiched by two sandwich slices of bread that do not have a crust on, on, on the white side, right? It's only got a crust around the outside. So I think by definition, like a sandwich can have uh, cooked meat in it. So say like a club sandwich has bacon in it. You have a steak sandwich. That's not a burger. But then I think a, a sandwich sandwich is open so it doesn't have a closed end like a hot dog. And <laughs> what am I doing? And is cut, the slices are cut out of bread. My guy. 
is there a standout song slash band slash movie slash movement that sparked a passion for music? Says bg.extreme.magnanimous.b. Hmm. Standout. I, I would say there's probably a lot. You know, the thing is about me and having to internalize and thinking about my passion for music because people ask me so much is really me unpacking all the musical experiences in my life, which I have many. And I don't think that there was one that sparked it. It's like, aha, I see the light. But I think what I'm learning a lot, I've talked before about influential music teachers. I've had, that's one. One I don't talk about enough is my dad just always having music on. And I think that I have very distinct memories of listening to music loud in the car with my dad. I think that is one of the moments. It wasn't a, a, an aha moment, but it was like, uh, in many ways, it's probably a form of therapy. It's like happiness, good times, special times is listening to music. And that was often loud in the car with my dad. And he still plays music at home if we'll go over there's music playing and not everyone does that uh so that's one movie uh almost famous was really important to me it came out in the early 2000s because it was this young journalist boy trying to like find his way to work with artists and be passionate about music and then you know he's he's shadowed by lester bangs uh, like a real figure in music and and they were talking about Iggy Pop and the Stooges, they were talking about psychedelic psychedelia, they're talking about The Who and Simon and Garfunkel, all of which was I was still learning about. And some of those that I just mentioned learned about from this film. So it was really like a portal, an early 2000s portal into the late 60s, early 70s. And I felt like that kid in many ways. And I was like a wistful romantic that like he was like kind of enamored with uh Kate Hudson, I think this like tragic kind of, she's not a groupie, she's a band-aid. Um, and I think I saw myself embodying that sort of person that's like, oh, I want to find that kind of experience in life and had a crush on Zoe Deschanel at the time as well. <laughs> so, you know, lots of things, lots of things. Top three hip hop artists slash bands by Doc Nod. Huh. I think Trap Called Quest will always have to be one by the nature of being the first significant hip hop group that actually meant something to me. And I I really like floored me when I discovered them and kind of sent me down a rabbit hole of things. So that has to be one. I hate to say it, but Kanye West. I wince because of all the horrific acts that he conducts and are unforgivable and I don't listen to him anymore, but it's true. Should I wax lyrical about him? I think it's fairly obvious he's one of the greatest artists of all time, has influenced multiple generations, has influenced sound of music in so many different ways, has been an influential entrepreneur in many ways as well, um, and redefined a genre that was classified in a particular space, in a particular way of presenting yourself. And I like artists that challenge their own sound and try to progress and evolve. And he's done that like five times, not always successfully, but I'm very grateful to have lived through the, the, the times of seeing that come out in real time. And uh, who's my third favorite hip hop artist? Uh, I still, I still very much like Jay Z, but not, I'm not like heavy, heavy. And you know, I, I think Blueprint is an amazing album, and 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 kind of the album surrounding that. But I think he's very talented. I think there's something about how he delivers, and the timing of how he delivers. Obviously, he's considered one of the greatest rappers of all time. But I think that there's a certain effortlessness to how he delivers his raps that when sometimes I listen to it, I'm like, man, no one can do it like this. No one. And I'm not a huge hip hop head in the sense that like, oh, I look at all the like ad libs, not ad libs is all like wordplay. I don't think about it like that. I just think it's like an emotional thing that he's able to like use words in such an interesting and um, inspiring way. 
Thoughts on Bossa Nova by Nua Bujakli. Bossa Nova is a funny one. I think Bossa Nova is really beautiful. And if you're like a young romantic, I think that it catches you early on because it, it really sounds like love. Uh, I think that Bossa Nova suffers from genres similar to that where, it, you know, background music uh, doesn't evolve in any particular way. So it's very formulaic. And so you, once you've heard three Bossa Nova songs, you've heard them all type thing. And that's not, true but i'm saying that in the sense that like it there's not like post bossa nova <laughs> you know what i'm saying or lo-fi bossa nova or um it, it didn't turn into like subcultures of its own so i i love bossa nova but it has its place and i think it has its limits as well what year would you like to be stuck in forever and why? I'm not a nostalgia person. This is asked from, from Adam Zajali. Uh, I would not, I'm not a nostalgia person that wishes us from another time or wishes I was, you know, that was better at X, Y, and Z. In saying that, 1976 just is, is a year that comes up in so much of my music collection because, you know, punk post-punk, R&B and soul, disco, dream pop, folk, and that kind of more extravagant side of folk, you know, latter, you know, Zeppelin type things. Uh, there's just so much music from 1976 that I think I love. And I think it's because it was like, this swirling of like the the new wave, quite literally, of English music happening, the tail end of the psychedelic era of music, and then there's like this alternative, like new pop folk scene that I really love as well. So, 1976, take me there. Let me poke around. What is your favorite painting slash artwork? Says Romna. I really want to think about this more. I want to do more about visual art, fine art. Um, not that I'm well educated on it, but I've been to a lot of, a lot, a lot, a lot of galleries in my time, and I've been to a lot of exhibitions, and you know, often by my wife, um, dragged on by my wife, but uh, she has tons, and I'm definitely less like deep. I'm more like, oh, I like that one. Okay, cool. Let's look at the next one. Uh, but. I would say whenever I see a Brancusi work, the sculptor, I love Brancusi because it's like, it's sculpture, but it's futuristic, but it's simple and elegant. There's just something about his work. It's it's like, you know, I, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna screw this up, but I'm gonna say like 20s to 40s, but it feels like it's like from, another you know there's there's that retro futurism type thing it's like it's like from a hundred years in the future from that and i just i i like stuff like that it's like it's not just like a, a pained image on a on a page or like abstract abstraction that's like you have to interpret all these different things i'm like this is like work of an alien it's beautiful so brancusi i very much like i would have to own a brancusi one day anyone got one to give me What's your opinion on or slash favorite UK post-punk band from the 80s? Asked Lobby Johnny. I love post-punk. Let's just keep it simple. My favorite post-punk band is Gang of Four. Entertainment is one of my favorite albums of all time. It is raw. It is angular. It is very uh, emotional in a way that's not you know, from the heart, it's like a head emotion. And uh, that was a very important record for me in my early 20s. So I don't hear enough people talk about Gang of Four, but I I always thought they were the most important pop, not pop punk, post-punk group when I first discovered them. And I feel like more people talk about a lot of other post-punk groups that aren't them now. And I don't know what I why I thought that at the time. So... I'm going to end with one more question. And I kept this one to the end because you know me. 
I like to keep my personal life fairly separate from this. But someone did ask the question about like, and I don't, I didn't write write their name, their profile down, but they asked, "How has having a kid changed your experience or or interpretation of music or something like that?" I wasn't going to mention it, and then I thought, "That's a great question because it has evolved." And I leave it at the end. So if if you're if you're hanging around to the end, then you get to hear me talk about um, fatherhood. But you know what's crazy about it is that I think that you realize how instinctual music can be, how much of a feeling thing it is. I'm all bunched up. My body's all scrunched up. I gotta open up a bit more. It's so. What happens is you see, you play. I play him. Not play him. I don't sit him down and play him, but I play all my favorite songs around him, not by choice. I'm not like here, son. You've got to listen to Gang of Honor. I'm just play. I play music, and it's whatever. It's background. I think sometimes he likes it because it just feels like livens up the room a little bit. But certain songs, certain songs, he's got like three, four, five different songs that just get him. And I don't think it's as as, as uh, you know significant to say, oh, these it's because these are really special songs in the world. I think they just capture something within his brainwave, in his vibration, within his DNA. That's like, what is this? So, a fairly obvious and good one because it's uh, it's got a, a swing to it is um, "Sparks" by Coldplay. Uh, it's got a, you know, it's in 6-8 timing, so it's got a kind of waltzy swing, right? It's almost like a lullaby. Lots of lullabies are in 3-4 or 6-8. Right. And it's a drifting song. That was the first song that you play. Anytime you play it to him, he freezes. If he's upset, he's hysterical. It's like the, the it's the, the fix. And if you're really desperate, you put that on. Uh I put on Day Tripper one day by the Beatles. He dropped everything and just stared out into space. And then his hands started to move. And it's like, what's going on? And you play him other Beatles and then he goes back to work playing with his things. You play, it, it only happened a couple of times, but he's used to it now. And it's like, what, what is happening here? He doesn't know the Beatles. He's heard all these other Beatles songs. You know, he might've heard all of Abbey Road and not cared. And then he heard, Day Tripper, and it's like, what's going on? Lastly, um, Ditto by New Jeans. Uh, I remember he was up really early, like four something in the morning. I could not think straight. I was so tired. So I just like thought, like, I'm just going to put the TV on because I just need a bit of time to like wake up. Bad, but anyway. And the New Jeans song had dropped, and I put it on. And I don't know if I implanted in him this memory after waking up, but ever since then, that is another one of those songs where if you need to calm him down, you play Ditto by New Jeans. And I don't think it's as simple as like, he just, it's it's a core memory because I made that for him. I think there's something about that song that again, connects with his inner being and is, is never, like it's just still to this day, something that he will just drop everything and tune into. So how has it changed my interpretation of music? It's just like, what is going on in his brain? And it makes you realize that more than artists, you know, as you know, Marvin Gaye being my favorite artist, it's not like I play that to him and he's going to be like, yeah, Marvin Gaye, this is great. And I, and, and I really like it and I'm going to feel it and dance to it. There's something deeper than that where it's like something hits me at a particular point in time and it's gone dung, and I've just dropped everything and... Uh, and I've been transported to an almost another life. Whoa, that trips me out. Another lifetime, you know, a former life. So it's not too deep in that, like I try to play him music, try to watch him connect with the universe. But when it happens, dude, it's the craziest thing ever and r it makes you realize that there's something about music that you cannot, you cannot write about. You cannot capture in a bottle it's just something that exists that has an impact that the songs that we connect with on a very deep level i don't think we have control over to that question about metrics that section about scratching the itch for me i think there are just some songs you don't even know why you know nice way to end it that was a really emotional a nice thing to like unravel and unpack and and, and try to understand for the appendix let's like quickly talk about 
the Fred again episode. I think I've had lots of great feedback about it. I think a lot of people were like, either I didn't know about it and made me realize that I'm in my own bubble. And obviously he performed in Australia recently. So I've, I've, I've been more in the bubble because I got to see the pandemonium in real life, but also, you know, he, he's not the, he's not a, a mega star. He's just a, a, a phenomenon in the electronic music scene. But I did get a, a lovely email. I forget your name, but um, Tolly, I think the name was a really cool name asking me about, why I didn't mention about his, uh, you know, and it was asked really politely and very kind. It was not nowhere threatening, like about his privilege, about his upbringing, about the fact that he was neighbors with Brian Eno, mentored, mentored by Brian Eno, was in a choir, Brian Eno's choir, whatever that is. Um, and you're right, you're right. I knew about it. I think when I hear criticisms of Fred again, people always jump straight to, well, he's rich. Well, he's rich and I've heard kind of like crazy rumors about him. Like I'm not even going to say them because I'm not, I don't know if they're true about where his family comes from, the lineage, the nepotism in the music industry, all these sort of things. And like, I think when I started to think about this stuff and, and research it, I, I tried to Google as best I can, could his background, his family, the lineage, and couldn't find much. So therefore, I didn't want to put out anything that I couldn't verify. All the things that I talked about were my observations and interpretations of how he existed and how he succeeded in the world. I could not find this person is in this industry and got him this thing. The only thing that's really out there is that he has a, a neighbor and family friend relationship with Brian Eno. It's a huge, huge uh, uh, benefit, leverage, all that sort of thing. I'm also the sort of person that I don't want to to kind of break it down to privilege. It is, it, it is part of him and it's part of a lot of people's uh, fortune for being in certain spaces because they, perhaps they had a very safe upbringing, a very middle-class upbringing and had the safety net or the, uh, or the confidence in themselves to be able to achieve in the arts. And that is true. And, and people could, you know, I'm not from a wealthy background, but I'm definitely middle class. And that helps me to have the ability to work in the creative industries and work in and think about and enjoy music and, and in the way that I do. I also know, you know, very, very wealthy individuals that I have a very, a lot of issues because they are kind of wrapped up in their head about like, you know, what and anything means because they can have everything at their disposal. So uh, I tend to have a broad view about these things and the influence that they have. And I don't think that it's as simple as something that I can unequivocally be like, well, he is successful because he's privileged. I should have mentioned it though, to be fair. I think I was playing it a little too safe to, to not mention it at all. Uh, but to be honest, I, I kind of, the truth is I kind of got whipped whipped up in my other list of things that he was able to achieve, the technological, uh, you know, time that he kind of found himself in and, and, and the fact that he was in the studio and all these sort of, and the marketing aspects of it, I kind of got whipped up into that more so than I got, I was thinking about, well, it's money and it's privilege and that's why he's there. But I should have mentioned, I, I, I don't say this is a kind of like, uh, a regret thing. It's just that it, it was, I would actually appreciate the email because it's like, oh, yeah, no, you're right. I should have, I didn't, I chose not to, but I also wasn't interested uh, as the main focal point to talk about that. So yeah, fascinating, interesting. That has been Derek G Speaks Volume. It's fun to do something different because it's uh, less exploratory in the sense that I've got to like construct an argument and more exploratory in terms of reacting to your questions and curiosities. I hope you learned a little bit about me. I hope you learned a bit more about my how I think about things and we'll do it again. So save your questions for the next time and uh, look out for an Instagram, I guess, if you want to ask me questions. And this has been Derek G Speaks Volumes. I will see you next week.